Welcome to Off Code, the show where we ignore the cultural codes and have real and intriguing conversations regarding the Black community and ways we can move forward to human flourishing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Off Code. I am Monique Dusan. And I am Kevin Briggins. And before you go anywhere, do anything, please hit that like and subscribe button as it helps us in the algorithms and help people find our channel and our content. Um, but with that said, with that out the way, once again, I think we have another great episode, at least one that I'm really excited about because not only is it a topic that's really important, but uh, we have a special guest that we're going to introduce and uh, I'm really excited about it. So, Yes, we have Delano Squires from the Heritage Foundation with us, but he's also like if you're on twitter or social media he's basically <laughs> everywhere like things with jason whitlock just he's everywhere yeah. and so we have him on to talk about the feminization of the black male voice one of the things that i'm noticing kevin is just this increase in black men who are either dressing like women or have this real feminized voice so to speak so maybe um maybe feministic so like advocating for black women and abortion or wanting to um just hold this position that's really feminist in nature but not just feminist feminized so to yeah. me this goes beyond you know wearing a dress or even being homosexual, this just seems to lean into the idea that many black men, in my personal opinion, have shrunken back in the cultural conversation. And so I'm just looking at where are, where's the strong black male voice? Now, our present company, not included. <laughs> I know. Yeah, no, no, I get what you're saying. And yeah, that is something that you know, we've known has been waning. You know, we talk about fatherlessness and a lot of black men didn't grow with fathers and, and all of that type of stuff. But from a entertainment Hollywood perspective, there does seem to be this element of what do you have to do to be embraced and accepted and successful? And I think that's something that we're going to be able to get into. Awesome. Let's bring Delano on. Hello, good sir. <laughs> How y'all doing this wonderful afternoon? We good. are good. <laughs> yeah, yes, Reformation, Reformation Day. We're Day. filming. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, so tell us a little bit about yourself before we jump into mm -hmm. this topic. Sure. Um, I am a research fellow here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, I'm in the Center for Life, Religion, and Family. Um, so I, I do a, a fair amount of research and writing on marriage, fatherhood, family formation, some on gender ideology, some on issues of life, a little bit on education, and then some on public safety. Uh, I'm also a contributor at The Blaze, uh, where I primarily contribute to Fearless for Jason Whitlock. So, you know, I've been on the show for about two years since it started, and I do a, I do a lot of, I've written basically two year, two columns per week for The Blaze since 2021. Um, and then on, on top of that, you know, I, I write for some other outlets. I've, I've written for The Root and The Griot um, earlier on in my life, as well as The Federalist and The Blaze. So I tell people I'm probably the only person in the country who can say he's had both Joy Reid and Jason Whitlock as an editor. Wow. Um, yeah. you know, so I've write on these issues of faith and uh, marriage, fatherhood, you know, in a number of public settings. I'm originally from New York. Uh, but I've been in the D.C. area about 16 years, uh, and I'm married to my lovely wife, Stephanie, for 11 years, and we have four children that we're raising together. So just a little bit about me. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so I was just telling Kevin, I want to talk about this particular topic because I'm seeing it just increase within culture, the idea of the feminization of the Black male voice. So mm -hmm. I think, or the first time I became aware of it is when I learned about Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson mm -hmm. is an actor, comedian from, I want to say like the early 70s, and he had a character named Geraldine. So this is a man dressed as Geraldine, his 
alternate personality, I guess. Um, but then if you go forward, you get people like Tyler Perry who dressed up as Medea and mm -hmm. Medea was, you know, everybody's big mama or, you know, great grandmother, grandmother mm -hmm. figure and things like that. As we go forward, even, or, you know, what, probably maybe even around the same time as Medea, we had people like, um, Martin and Shanene or big mama's mm -hmm. house and, you know, Eddie Murphy in, um, the, what was that? The club movie. What was that? Um, where he said Hercules, Hercules. Yeah. You, know, you know that movie. <laughs> was, it Professor, not, was it called Professor Clump? No, Professor something. It was uh, the Nutty Professor. The, okay, Nutty there professor. we go. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So you had him dressing up as a woman, but then you go, you know, more into our current culture, and you have Zaya Wade, which is Dwayne Wade's daughter or son. son. It is. It's his son. And mm -hmm. Zaya is a boy, but they are transitioning him to be a girl. And then you have people like Little Nas X, who I'm just going to let the picture speak for itself because I don't really know what to say. And whatever I would say is just petty at this point. So <laughs> then you have, you know, Little Nas X and he is just a whole. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's, he's yeah. A, an openly flamboyant gay rapper entertainer so. thank you thank you that is better than what i was gonna say so delano are you noticing any like are you noticing a, a feminization of the black male voice overall or is this something you think that maybe people are just going along to get along and i'm kind of out of pocket well i mean i, I definitely noticed um, this trend, and I certainly would say it's the black male voices as, as well as the black male image, right? Um, because images are powerful. And, and when you depict people in certain, um, types of, you know, respects, there's a lot that you draw from that. And, and one of the things I say to people is that as much as the 20th century was a fight for black, you know, political rights and civil rights, it was also a fight for the black public image. Um, there's a reason that we don't have blackface story hour in the same way that we have drag queen story hour. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that black folk fought against, um, you know, minstrelsy and blackface and other negative depictions in, in the broader mass media. And it's because, you know, people, um, make judgments based on depictions. There's a reason that Gordon Parks is so celebrated his, his imagery of just the everyday normalcy of black life. Of, of a husband and wife going to church together, dressed a certain way, dignified. Um, all of those things, I think, speak to a time when Black folk, particularly Black leaders, the Black leadership class, understood the power of imagery, understood the power of media. Uh, and I think what's happened in the last 60 years or so is that um, there's been an effort, and I'm only, you know, you know this better than most, all of the sort of the critical theory, oppressed mm -hmm. oppressor classes, um, uprooting anything that is seen as normative um, has been used even in, in this respect. So the notion that a black man in a dress is something that we should uh, reject. You have people now, particularly in the pop, pop culture, particularly black pop culture, who will say, no, we should embrace all this, right? We should embrace Lil Nas X with images of him being quote unquote pregnant with his Mm -hmm. with his new album or Zaya Wade, right? And and we should embrace his new identity as a, a um I think I think his name was um I can't remember what his what his former name was. Mm -hmm. it might not I think it was Zion or whatever it is. And yeah. now he's Zaya. And we should embrace that. And the NAACP embraces that. And the Urban League embraces that. And any black person in good standing in the media has to embrace that. Uh if they want to to remain in good standing and have their black card accepted where all, all black cards can be, you know, used. So, yeah, so I, I'm not sure it's a new thing, but it certainly seems to be intensifying. And I think a large part of that is because the black leadership class, the people that I refer to as the Afrostocracy, the black progressive politicians, pundits, professors, preachers, and performers are all on the same page 
um, with respect to anything having to do with quote unquote pride, LGBT rights, so on and so forth. And a big part of that is acceptance of um, uh, not just homosexuality and transgenderism, but uh, feminism and the notion that black men uh, left in the unreconstructed state represent a moral threat to black women. So what we should do with black men is to um, change their image, change the way they think, change the way they dress, change the way they speak, so that anything that is uh, more feminine, you, if y'all have seen these memes with Black Boy Joy and this guy like frolicking in the field and there's flowers all around, mm -hmm. like that's cool. But a, with a bunch of Black men in suits walking down the street in Philadelphia or Charlotte, oh no, that reinforces traditional notions of masculinity. So we have to fight against that. So it's, it's deconstruction all the way down sort mm -hmm. of the line. And I think that's a big part of what we're picking up on, on right now. So essentially what I hear you saying is that the black card for men is tied almost exclusively to their sex, gender, masculinity. And because of things like critical theory and deconstruction and probably even like post-colonial theory and what it means to be um, a participant in colonialism and to have a colonialized mind, you need to remove all that in order to remain black. Is that, yeah. am I hearing you correct? Yeah, I, I, I think that's how the, the people who see the world this way approach it. Um, and, and one of the reasons I think is, is some black men have been slow to understand this is because race, well, let me say it this way, um, racism has been in many respects, the, the glue that served as like a bonding agent for black people for the last, in this country, 250 plus 300, 400 years. So whether you were a black doctor or a black janitor in 1920, there's certain places you couldn't go and certain places you couldn't live, certain places you couldn't eat. Um, but when, you know, we make gains in civil rights, that that bonding agent has has been lessened. So um, I think one of the things that we've seen is the sort of the deconstructionists have say, look, the black heterosexual male, particularly the black heterosexual Christian male, is only one degree off from, in terms of uh, his oppressor points, for lack of a better term, than the white heterosexual Christian male. The mm -hmm. only thing that they, that they, that in area in which they differ is is their race, but all the other stuff that comes with being a heterosexual Christian man is exactly the same. And we need to train that out of them. Mm. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons you see all of these traditional civil rights organizations saying, no, like pride is the new black. They might as well just say, mm -hmm. I mean, NAACP yes. right now might as well just say that. Mm -hmm. um, pride is the new black. We think uh, abortion is part of our sort of uh, liberation project. Mm -hmm. And the black men who want to move up on the left, on the political left, have to accept those terms. So whether it's, and I'm going to name some names because this is what I do. Go ahead. We yeah, come on, let's go. Let's bring go it. Ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. But if, if you want to be um, governor of Maryland, like Westmore is, you, you have to show up at the pride parade and celebrate. Not just tolerate. Mm -hmm. You need to celebrate. Um, if you want to be a Raphael Warnock, if you want to be a uh, Jamal Bryant, Pastor Jamal Bryant, you have to lament the fall of Roe, right? Mm -hmm. You 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 celebrate abortion as a fundamental human right, um, and any black man that differs from that script should be uh, expected should expect to be criticized harshly, and it's not about how you say it because Tony Dungy, or NFL Hall of Fame coach, football analyst on NBC is as winsome as they come and he promotes traditional marriage pro-life fatherhood adoption and it doesn't matter how nicely he says these things he shows up at a march for life rally and he's attacked as basically mm -hmm. being a closeted white supremacist and bigot mm -hmm. so so yeah so these things are, are to me inextricably linked um and to the extent that again having your black card accepted means having to swallow no pun intended the pride agenda, mm -hmm. um, 
hetero, traditional heterosexual Christian black men need to understand what time it is. Um, and, and I'm not sure that most of them do at this point. And now I was looking at something earlier today, trying to think of like this conversation and even went back to somebody like Lecrae a couple of years ago who said mm. that, you know, before we can even talk about, you know, abortion or, you know, for people mm. who do want to talk about abortion, how about we also talk about all of these other things? And so, mm. you know, I, I hear what you're saying and I think a lot of times we talk about people like a Raphael Warnock or like a Jamal Bryant, who we may see as being, you know, way out there while we still listening to somebody like Lecrae, mm -hmm. who kind of thinks the same, the same way. You know what I mean? Or I can mm. think about um, Pass the Mic with Jamar Tisby and him having similar comments, maybe not as, as you know, out there, but kind of. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, mm. in his 2019, 2020 interview, um, where he was just having a conversation with his podcast partner about, you know, black women and abortion and everybody wants to come down on abortion, but we don't, we never want to talk about these things. And we can't actually tell a woman, you know, like what to do when we have all of these other things going on. And so I, yeah, I definitely hear that it's way out there, but it's also closer to home with people that, that we might think are treading this even like pseudo reform line or this yeah. you know staunch christian line and it's like no nah, it is so intricately connected to blackness for many christians mm. i'm sorry kevin i didn't mean i just i kept talking i'm so sorry <laughs> no no you're good that's a good point but i mean those those two brothers you mentioned I mean, they've been for so far off the reform track for a long time now you know um, but Delana, you did say something that I was going to bring up that I wanted you to talk about. I kind of want you to expand on it because I don't want our audience to miss it. You know, we talk about the black card and mm -hmm. I want to talk about your five P's, right? You went through the mm -hmm. list. It's the, the, the preachers, the professors, the, you know, that whole list. Can you kind of you know, right. go through that list again mm -hmm. and kind of explain how mm -hmm. they kind of hold, they're kind of the gatekeepers for this, this right. black, what is blackness, right? And if you want to be mm -hmm. a part of this club and accept it, those five kind of offices kind of dictate to the mm -hmm. black community what's acceptable. Can you kind of talk about Oh, that's that? good. Mm. It's interesting you said offices and, and this is Reformation Day and we're all believers. And uh, it's all, when you said offices, I thought, oh, this is, this is the new black fivefold ministry. But, but yes. Uh, but yes. You better go ahead. <laughs> yes. Hold on. I had yes. never thought that before. Um, so, so, yeah, so, I, I, that, I, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I use the term Afrosocracy fairly often in my writing and, and sort of public commentary. And, and full disclosure, the first person I heard use Afrosocracy was actually Michael Larry Dyson. And this is many, many moons ago. I think he might have used it in the book he wrote about Bill Cosby. So this was like 04, 2003, 2004. And I read that book um, coming out of college. Now, he used it to describe Bill Cosby. And I think he was just thinking, you know, older, old guard, you know, black, center-right, traditional man. But as is often the case in, in academia, right, you can sort of take a particular concept and build on it. And the structure that I put around it and the, the flesh that I put on the bones um, is that the aristocracy, as I said, the black progressive leadership class. And it's comprised of politicians, pundits, um, professors, preachers, and performers. So you have elected officials, people in government and in, in all different types of capacities. Pundits, I would also include journalists, so people in the media on the information side. Um, preachers, obviously the black church has a significant um, role in terms of the social agenda for the larger black community. Um, Professors, again, the, the the black intellectual tradition is is a long one, and now you know, you you can even see from, and this is a related criticism, how that tradition has started to to devolve. And I think, just in recent years, from Cornell West to Michael Eric Dyson to Tanahasi Coates to Ibram X Kendi slash um, Nicole Hannah Jones. 
every time the baton has been moved, it's been passed downward in time, from my perspective, in terms of the quality of the ideas. And then performers. So these are your athletes and entertainers. And these are the people collectively who un sometimes um, sort of forthrightly and openly, but sort of unspokenly, set the agenda for the Black community. These are the ones that make issues trend on social media. These are the ones that marshal political uh, clout, cultural capital, and financial resources for sp specific causes. These are the people that give you Black Lives Matter. These are the people that get on MSNBC and CNN and say, you know, X, Y, Z are the issues that Black people really care about. Um, and one of the things that I think is important, and I'll unpack something here that I haven't talked about as much, is to juxtapose the Afrostocracy, right? Sort of that combination of, you know, African, you know, African-American and aristocracy. So th these, are, again, the Black leadership class, to compare and contrast them with the talented 10. So that concept that boys unpacked over hundred years ago, I would argue that the talented 10, regardless of what you feel about social hierarchy, um, cause I think it's inevitable, but I would argue that the talented 10, generally speaking, those black pe people, that leadership class of a, de a century ago, believed that they had a responsibility to less fortunate, less educated, less upwardly mobile black folk to help them, to help bring them along, oftentimes expressed by uh, specifically speaking to them, oftentimes about their behavior and their way of thinking and their way of doing things. And this is why they stress so much uh, virtues like temperance and self-control and thrift um, and religious piety um, and, and industriousness, that type of thing. So they use their platform, their education, right, for the benefit of those who they saw that were a little bit lower down on the socioeconomic status in order to bring them up. What the aristocracy does is they invert that relationship. And what they do is they use the, the, the pain and misfortune of the Black lower class to extract benefits, social, capital, political benefits upward. And they say... For instance, like USA Today had a tweet last year. That I'm paraphrasing. It said, a year ago, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis and corporate America promised to do more to diversify. And one year later, those promises have not been met. And no one has been hit harder by that than black women in corporate America. So you see the play. George Floyd mm -hmm. died on the street in Minneapolis. And because of that, I, as a black woman, deserve a corner office at Google or Amazon. And this is what they do all the time. They will point to disparities that, that are concentrated among lower, you know, socio socioeconomic rungs, particularly in Black America, and say, therefore, give me this thing that I desire um, at a much higher level. So, again, I I'll just use the George Floyd example. George Floyd in life, if seen on a street corner by a member of the Talented Tenth, that person would have said, you need to clean up your act. You need to put away the reefer, put down the bottle, go to this this class where we're teaching uh, carpentry and welding and so on and so forth. And you need to go down the street to First Baptist Church of Insert City and, and hear the good gospel from preachers such and such and so and so and get married and have children and so on and be a credit to your race. George Floyd in life to the aristocracy would say, there's no problem that you have the complete elimination of white supremacy would not fix. Every every pathology that you express is actually caused by white supremacy. You you have you should feel no obligation to change your behavior. Society should um, feel an obligation to change its social structures to accommodate your lived experience. When both when when that person let I was not personalize it, but let's say that person dies tragically. Talented Tempest says, you see, we, we tried to warn him that the path he was on was going to lead him to destruction. And it's unfortunate, but I hope other people learn a lesson from that. Aristocracy says, you see, all of these social structures have conspired against this man and have led to his death. Now pay us. Mm. Pay us because of what happened to him. Mm. I want you to outfit my DEI consultancy. You need to hire me to come talk to your 
to your company about how white people could be better at allies, so on and so on and so forth. You need to have support BLM. You need to support this particular candidate. You need to get Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima off of these packages, same way you did to Lando Lakes, right? Take the land and get rid of the Indian. You need to do all of these things in support of our particular program and with the thought that social justice and economic equality will trickle down to the black lower class, but it only gets as far as the black middle class and everybody gets to pat themselves on the, on the back and say, well, we're doing the same thing our forebears did in the civil rights movement. But it's a very, very different dynamic that the black upper class has with the black lower class when you move from the talented 10th into the, the aristocracy. I know it was, it was a long, wind up but I, I just wanted to sort of sketch out the no. difference between those two groups of people no man that was that was good that was i mean clip that and put that out like that <laughs> was <laughs> no man oh. that, that was good um that was good for real and it, it kind of goes in line with something i've been saying and just kind of my thinking of the kind of the way we that shift you're talking about from let's say our grandparents generation to what what the, the black leaders of today are selling and, and I've always felt just my observations. It seems as if what the civil rights movement taught us and the success that it was, was that our political, social, and monetary capital was in our grievances, right? Mm. And in that grievances, that's what we must build off of. That's what we must to go forward, to move up. And it kind of is what you're saying George Floyd dies, we use that grievance to then cipher benefits from the society, right? Um, but the people who are benefiting from that are already the elite upper class, right? It never goes down to the people like the George Floyds, like the inner cities, like Chicago, Baltimore. It never affects them. It only generates benefits and revenue for the the already elites within the culture, within the society. And that's why you get the crumps, right? Mm -hmm. Showing up. That's why you get the, um, um, all of the, 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 the people, the, the, the normal people who show up at a funeral of someone they never met to get in front of the camera, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're going to leverage that for benefits for their own benefit, mm -hmm. right? They are building on the backs of the lower class. And like you said, it's completely inverted from what it used to be. And so that's just kind of my thoughts from what, what you were saying. It, it seems to just kind of hit home <laughs> as to what we're seeing and some of the frustrations that we have with the current black leadership that seems to be beholden to mm. a certain ideology or a certain tribe that they use to benefit themselves personally. They, they know has no benefit to what we would call the inner city, the hood, right? Nothing yeah. they do, they know will change that situation. And so it's just a frustration that they seem to be, like you say, just cashing in. And the people who, who we know personally just kind of follows behind mm -hmm. and that they just never benefit from it. The idea, man, and, and Dubois and the whole talented 10th and all of that. And that's a whole show by itself. But mm -hmm. yes, at the time when he was writing, there was a real true white supremacy. There was this mm -hmm. idea of, you know, this is the way that we want to run this area, this region, this nation, what, how, wherever, you know, you landed being a black person, you could rise up and come up against you know someone who truly mm -hmm. had that way of thinking but there was still within the black culture this idea of masculinity mm -hmm. that masculinity had its place that the family had its place and that within the family the man had his own role that was really distinct and how he led his family but that was based on autonomy so if little tyrone didn't want to do the things that you know, you should do to be able to, A, create a stable environment for yourself and for your family. Well, you're going to reap the the repercussions of that. Today, it's a very collectivist mentality. And so when little Tyrone hurts, everybody hurts. When little Tyrone mm. stubbed his toe, everybody stubbed their toe. And it's the white person's fault 
who put the dresser or the Lego on the floor in the first place. That is yeah. completely different than the way people thought about it, you know, 75, 80 years ago. But what we see in that shift is that the voice of this masculine voice that I think really helped to propel our community mm. is now succumb to the cultural norms and the cultural ideologies. And that that says that if you want to be the right kind of black person, the, the good black person or the good black man, this is what you need to do. But it also speaks to the women. There's a book out. It came out in 2021 by Sonora. I want to say her last name is like Ja. Um, and her book is titled Raising Feminist Sons, something to that effect. But it's it's a manifesto on how to raise a feminist son. I think in looking both at, you know, the talented 10th and this or a ton, like this idea of autonomy and then the idea of this more collectivist mentality, I'm wondering if because it because in the idea of this collectivist mentality and the the increase of the black female voice, do you mm -hmm. think that the black male voice has just had to take a back seat because the black female voice is so strong? Like, do you think that these two voices can live simultaneously? Um, do I do I think they can live simultaneously? Yes, I do. Um, one, because I'm a Christian, so I have hope. And, and I believe in the natural order. I think, not that I think, I, I know we are created beings, right? So men and women, regardless of, of ethnic background, created in the image of God, you know, according to Genesis 127, equal in dignity and worth, but different in form and function. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you call yourself a you know, complementarian or, you know, egalitarian, that, like that, that's further down the road. But I think all of us can acknowledge that men and women are different. Our bodies are made differently because we do different things um, as embodied people. So do I think that men and women can, particularly black men and women can coexist? Absolutely, I do. But I don't think we can do it apart from God's created order. And one of, if I had to focus in on one of the P's within the aristocracy, the, the black preacher has in many cities and in many contexts, I'm not saying, let me put all of the necessary caveats. I'm not <laughs> right. saying all black preachers. I'm not saying all black churches. And when we, you and I, we met each other uh, down in South Carolina recently mm -hmm. uh, at a conference where a church was doing this very, very well in terms yes. of ministering to the needs of, of, of uh, its congregants who happen to be black folk. And particularly in, in, a, in a whole sort of comprehensive family, uh, healthy family model. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that we can get that across our community if we continue to reject God's design for humanity. Mm -hmm. And the black, many black preachers have abdicated their role as heralds of the good news. And they have turned the black church um, into basically just another political organ, particularly within the black community, for the left. So mm -hmm. these churches will run backpack drives and food pantries, and there's nothing wrong with that. But your local, you know, Urban League, Thursday night, you know, young professionals network can run a backpack drive. Mm -hmm. You can you can get a small business to 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 give away laptops, you know, before the school year. But when churches no longer preach the good news, and they certainly many of these churches no longer adhere to so the biblical orthodoxy, when it comes to sexual ethics, the rest of the community is going to suffer. And I think that's what we're seeing now. So when when you have black churches across the country, in the South, in the Northeast, on the West Coast, who, when Roe falls, are saying, well, next up is going to be, quote, unquote, marriage equality. So, so what does that even mean? Right? Like, mm -hmm. biblical marriage is between one man and one woman for one lifetime. But, but many of these churches have been co-opted. And for them, the greatest source of bondage in the world is not sin, but, but is economic equality. And that's why they do not mind promoting a, a pro-abortion, pro-pride agenda um, if they think that at the end of that will be the type of you know social and economic spending they want for the Black community. 
Now, and, and what's made this even worse in the last, you know, let's say four or five years is the carrot of reparations mm-hmm. that is being sort of, you know, yep. hung above the heads of the mm-hmm. black community. And, and people may have different views on that. And I think even black Christians, some mm-hmm. of whom disappointingly will proof text, you know, the gospels and say, oh, look, this person had to pay. They, their restitution is equivalent to, you know, reparations yeah. today. Uh-huh. But p- putting the arguments for and against reparations to the side for a minute, the one thing that I've never heard any of these people do, particularly even black Christians, is to ask what reparations would cost black America. Mm. Because Monique, you, you've probably gotten this conversation in a way that, that me and Kevin have not. Well, most of the black women I know have had a mother, a grandmother, auntie at some point tell them, baby, don't go accepting gifts from no man because if a man gives you something, he's mm. going to want something in return. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost mm-hmm. you. Nothing in life is free. Nothing. So if you think a political party is about to start cutting checks for twenty five, fifty, seventy five, dollars $100,000 per person, mm-hmm. per person, mm-hmm. and they want, they'll want they want nothing from you, 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 your head is in the sand. Right. My, my perspective on what they'll want is going to go something like this. It's 20 in 2023, 2033. Three years post reparations. Checks are cleared. People are using it all different types of ways. Um, the income inequality within Black America has exploded because the, the middle class Black folk who play options with their own money, now they're playing it with Uncle Sam's money. So they've, they've done a lot better, right? Uh-huh. The top has been blown off. Low economic spectrum. Some people bought cars that they've needed, paid off bills that they've had to, so on and so forth. Sure. But there's been a lot of consumer spending. Okay, all that. But here's what it costs. Local Planned Parenthood of Harlem, let's say. I'm from New York. Planned Parenthood of Harlem or East Flatbush. They call up Breakfast Club and say, hey, Charlemagne, um, our abortion numbers are kind of flagging for the last couple of months because for some whatever reason, you know, since the checks have gone out, not as many women are choosing to uh, avail themselves of our services. I think you all should make a few um, announcements over the radio and say, hey, if now is not the right time for you to have that child, why don't you check mm-hmm. out Planned Parenthood at East Flatbush or Harlem? And they'll, they'll help you make the right decision for you and your baby because you don't want to squander the wealth that you just came, came into, right, before you're ready to have a child. That's what the costs sound like. Mm-hmm. It's it's when it's when the local when when the um uh when the local chapter of human rights campaign calls up the, the chapter president of NAACP in Cleveland and says, Look, we're trying to get our pride curriculum into Cleveland public schools, but mm-hmm. for some reason some of the preachers in your network are not down for this. Do you all remember how we as a human rights campaign set aside our legitimate grievances about being discriminated against? far longer than you have, because we couldn't marry legally until 2015. And we advocated on your behalf with respect to reparation. Can you do us a solid and help Uh us with trying to get our materials and the gender unicorn into your schools? And here he come just like, you know, Margaret Sanger said that they would and said, "Yep, come on, black folk, we've been discriminated against for all these years. We can't turn around and do the same thing to our LGBT, same gender loving brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. That's what it's going to cost you. Yeah. But nobody yeah. thinks that way because when the green, when all you see is green, you, the, the, the ink, the, the rainbow that's been encroaching on your territory for so long, mm-hmm. you become blind to it. Um, so I, I think this is all part and parcel of what the, the aristocracy is priming us for. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's only going to get worse if, if you accept somebody's money and think that they're not going to ask anything from you in return. Hey family, I wanted to take a minute and talk to you about Birmingham Theological Seminary. It's my seminary and it's a place that I extremely appreciate. They have small class sizes, very reasonable tuition, and professors who are committed to your education and to my education. If you are looking to extend your theological education and are considering seminary, I encourage you to check out Birmingham Theological Seminary. You can go to bts.education for more information. 
you know, we know BLM uh, was basically <laughs> was basically an LBGTQ organization posing as a black organization, right? Mm. Um, and we see, you know, when Florida, state of Florida was redoing their curriculum, one of the talking points or the sticking points they want to redo their African-American studies curriculum is because it had an entire section on queer theory, right? Mm-hmm. So we're talking about this feminization of the black voice. What is this tie in between this kind of LBGTQ ness and the black community? Why is this seems to be this pairing of the two to kind of push out? And that's what we're seeing with Lil Nas X mm-hmm. and all these other things. Kind of, kind of, can you, can you kind of explain or break that down for us? Sure. Sure. I, I think the, the link is this and, and you, I think your BLM sort of history is a hundred percent spot on. And the rise of BLM really, to me, should be seen as a judgment against the black leadership class. Mm. The reason I say that is because when a pro-black organization shows up at your doorstep and they say, we want to, we're against police brutality and all this other stuff. And you go to their list of principles and none of them use the word police or brutality, but their black villages principle starts with, um, you know, the, the destruction of the Western prescribed nuclear family, that should set off alarm bells for every black online outlet, the root, the Grio, the Roland Martins of the world, for every black politician, for every black civil rights organization. They should have said, well, why would a, I mean, we got issues in the black community, but too many intact families is not one of them. So, so yeah, I, I agree with your assessment of BLM. I think the reason that these things are linked is because the people who believe in that sort of interlocking system, you know, of oppression, the, the, and I think that phrase was first used by the, the women who wrote the Kambahi River Collective many moons ago, I think in the 1970s, they see any social norms, any, anything that's not normative as black and anything that's normative as white. Mm. So, um, whiteness in terms of skin color, ethnicity is white, obviously. And, and blackness is not normative. So the norm is the white European aesthetic. And, you know, we are sort of in the category of, of the oppressed, but maleness is white. Christianity is white. Straightness is white. Um, being quote unquote cisgender is white. Being thin is white. So that's why all these other things on the other side, um, being uh, obese, right? If you talk about that, that's fat phobia. If you reject the notion that men can get pregnant, that's transphobia. If you say, well, we believe that, you know, uh, marriage is between one woman and one man, that's homophobia. Um, and, but, but the linkage, and, and it's key to get the linkage because I think what some black folk would like to do is to say, well, we believe every charge of racism, but we reject the other three things that I just mentioned, but these things are a package deal. Mm -hmm. So if we want to address accusations, let's say black Christians want to address accusations of being transphobic because we actually believe in Genesis 127, then we have to ask ourselves to what extent have accusations of racism been, been used as a cudgel Mm -hmm. against white people in order to excuse bad behavior um that's that comes from black folk uh so so yes all these things are linked and 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 the queer theory as i said queerness Mm -hmm. has become sort of intertwined with blackness and one of these i think is actually quite practical um the black population has been about between 11 and 13 11 Mm -hmm. let's say 11 to 15 percent for the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. But that's what you get when you abort 33% of your babies. Right. But the pride, the queer community, the LGBT community, quote unquote, represents a growth market because 20% of Gen Z Americans identify as LGBT. Mm-hmm. So if you attach yourself to a growing population, mm-hmm. um, you can get both the points for being on the side of the oppressed. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can get a significant swath of black folk who now, again, see those two identities as, as interlocked. And yes, BLM helped do that. Mm -hmm. People like David Johns, 
who used to be head of President Obama's uh, initiative on African-American excellence. Uh, I bring him up because he did a live re-education session on Malik Yoba, the actor from, we talk about the 90s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. New York Undercover. Yep. Yep. Malik Yoba was Idris Elba before Idris Elba was Idris yes, Elba. He was. Man, you went yes, there. he yep. was. Yes, he was. You know what I mean? the archetype of black masculinity played a, a police detective in New York City. And he was on The Breakfast Club a few years ago with David Johns, who's openly gay, and two um, people who appear to be women, but actually are, are men, but identify as women. But these counterfeits are of a much higher quality than what you see sort of, you know, walking down the street at five in the morning. <laughs> but um, Idris Elba made he used the phrase, a naturally born woman or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And David John stopped him and said, uh-uh, uh-uh, there's nothing natural about it. And proceeded to make Idris, uh, excuse me, Malik Yoba, excuse me, Malik Yoba, <laughs> repeat after him, people who were um, what is it? assigned female at birth for whom their gender identity does not match their sex, or something mm -hmm. to that effect. Mm-hmm. And in live time, you saw sort of the archetype of black masculinity from the 1990s capitulate wow. yep. to the new orthodoxy of gender yes. ideology. Yes. And, and that, that is what every institution in this country, particularly the black ones, want for black men. They want to march us up broke buck mountain, and they mm -hmm. want us to help them raise the pride flag that they think should be at its summit. So what is apex? Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's where we are today. Ma, hold on one second, because this, this, I need to ask Delano this, because when I <laughs> see something like that, I'm like, he better be glad I went on the breakfast club, because I would have said, like, where the men? Where's the backbone? Where's the, like, you're not going to tell me. Like, where mm -hmm. is that, man? <laughs> like, I'm just, they scared yeah. I mean, honestly, if, if you, if you want, again, you want to be in good standing, and then a part of this, honestly, is quite practical. Um, and I say this, and I and I can say this because and I've, me and my wife have joked about this. If I was my age and in my stage with my views, but single, maybe I would have some incentive to pull my punches ever so slightly. But I'm married, so there's not there's, there's nothing that anybody could offer me in terms of in the sexual marketplace. Mm. I'm not say I don't say the things that I say to in, impress. Um, any particular woman. I'm not out looking for a wife. I have a wife at home, so I'm free to speak in ways mm. that some people are not because they they still want access to, to black women. So if you're the type of guy that really cares what black women think about you, one, as an ally, but two, as a potential partner, you have every incentive publicly to um, hide or shave down or distort what you actually believe about the world. And my thing yes. is this, if, if, let's say I was on Breakfast Club, and I hope to, to be on there one day. And and Charlemagne or DJ Envy said, you know, they're pushing the standard line because, if, as you see, they have the pride flag placed prominently behind every guest on the show. Mm -hmm. I would ask them, I said, okay, so do you really think that a man who quote unquote identifies as a woman is as much of a woman as your wife or your girlfriend or your mother or your daughter, right? And if they say yes, I said, okay. So if you were single and you were looking for a mate and you were on a dating app and they asked you in terms of the women you're interested in, whether you are open to trans women as, as well as cis women, are you going to check that box? They'd be like, no. swipe, swipe. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. so they don't really believe this. Mm -hmm. No, but they're pushing a message. To say. Correct. Yep. yep. But if you want to be in good standing, if you don't want to, you know, and, and I mentioned, you know, Roland Martin briefly, but I remember Roland Martin, he told to me, it wasn't an off color joke, but to glad it was, he told a joke about David Beckham and an H and M commercial where David Beckham was modeling some boxes or something. This was like 2016. And he said something to the effect of if any of the guys at your Super Bowl party are cheering this commercial, you need to smack them. And it was, he was joking. It was on Twitter, but, Glad said, no, this is this is a homophobic stance. Yep. And mm -hmm. and they walked him down. And now he would so now you fast forward when the leaders of BLM are on there and they're pushing, you know, their queer agenda, their anti family, anti God agenda. Cause we didn't even talk about the fact that they, they're into divination. So that's another reason that Christians mm -hmm. should not be following them. 
Um, there's no way that he's going to say anything that seems to even go against the pride agenda in any way, shape, or form. All of these guys know how to be obedient when the time comes. And in the same way that many women, black and white, but, but let's say within the black community, high power women in media, in sports, in politics, who will never say a cross word against trans ideology or transgenderism. And even the ones that identify as feminists and strong women, and I can, they, they finally fed a, found a group of men that they can submit to. Because when Zaya Wade says that he is a woman, or when Dr. Rachel Levine, the Assistant Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, says that he is a woman, all of them nod in affirmation. Mm-hmm. Because again, when, when you've seen yourself as an as oppressed for your entire life, the last thing you want to do is be cast in the role of oppressor. Mm-hmm. And, and, and black men have seen themselves mm-hmm. as oppressed by racism, so they cannot afford to be seen as an oppressor by black women. Black women have seen themselves as oppressed duly by racism and sexism, so they are extremely vulnerable of, to charges of oppression by, quote-unquote, transgender men. And so, and and when the transhumanist or trans ageist movement hits, uh-huh. mm-hmm. transgender people today are going to be claimed, are going to be said to say, "Look, when you're transgender. You have you have no idea what it feels like to be transhuman, mm-hmm. right? I've I've never had my rights respected. Um, you know, I, some days I feel like a puppy, or you know, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever." And no one has ever affirmed me the way they've affirmed you. And by you not supporting my rights as a transhuman individual who is into puppy play and other types of things, you are oppressing me in the same way that cisgender women oppressed you. And now they're going to feel vulnerable. Mm. Yep. Mm. That's the chain. You you hitting on um, the matrix of oppression and all of the... Mm-hmm intersections that everybody has that makes them an oppressed person except for you know white cisgender christian men um Mm. but you know this goes all the way down i'm glad that you hit on transhumanism i'm glad that you hit on you know this conversation of age and all Mm -hmm. of that what i think that many people are missing it and we are missing it largely because of now I, i will I will take the heat for this. So, so I'll say it. to me, a uh, feminization of the male voice across the spectrum, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. in the church. Um, but we ain't talking about the issue of a religious minority and a religious oppression that is mm. right here on the scene with all of this other stuff that's popping up. But that's not today's conversation. But I'm just putting that out there because <laughs> you're you hitting, you hitting on all of these, these intersections. Well, what do we do when our leaders, our men are silent? And I, I want to bring this around in, in our last few minutes together to the church mm-hmm. because mm. yes, in the black church, we have this issue, but I would even thread this out a bit farther because our audience is black and white and everything else. Mm-hmm. We have an issue in my personal opinion, in the church with a male voice that is either silenced or succumbed to the culture. Think about Andy Stanley. Mm -hmm. So when we think about this this male voice that has now succumbed to the culture, this is why your youth group is marching for Hamas. Your, Mm. your, your, Your people are identifying as queer because the leadership is lacking the voice the prophetic voice to this generation that in my opinion should come largely from the men to give the direction as to where we are going i feel like they sitting back waiting for the culture to tell them where we should go oh yeah so biblically like from from the position of christian men where do y'all begin to roar like restructure that <laughs> voice because I, and i gosh there's so you said so much like i do think before you even go down that road i do think that you're right and spot on with the idea that you know if you're married and you're speaking into these things what you got to lose like you got yours but if you right. are a single person and mm-hmm. and i'm single so out of the three of us i'm the single one i do think that 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 
issue comes up a lot. Like you, like if I say that Andy Stanley, or if I say that two men don't go together, like mm -hmm. I, I know that I'm limiting my pool of prospects. And well, I mean, you, you don't want a feminist husband anyway. So oh, God, just about to say that. Uh, the devil is a lie. I don't know what kind of cars y'all drive, but I don't want nobody showing up in a Prius. I don't <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. No, honey. Yeah. Um, uh -uh. Yeah. Mm -mm. I don't yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah, Can't be passive. Like, <laughs> well, I don't know if we should own guns. No, honey, we should own more, multiple. But, mm -hmm. um, you so when I think about just the idea of the feminization of the male voice now and expounding mm -hmm. it out, and I know that this is a, a show where we're looking at black culture and things like that, but this is mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is truly an issue within the church. What, and I'm gonna ask both of y'all, what do y'all say? to either the man who's struggling or the community who's struggling people who don't know how to how to stand i feel like paul mm. would be like emasculate yourself but i'm trying to be more gracious <laughs> i don't know help me out I, I, i'll go first and i'll let delano get mm -hmm. the last word on this um to me the black church has been captivated by liberation theology and mm. the white church has been captivated by Martin Luther King's letter to a Birmingham jail from a Birmingham jail. Right? Mm. They are so afraid of being on quote unquote, the wrong side of history. They're so afraid of not being allies. And, um, they're so afraid of being viewed as racist or oppressors or whatever yeah. category wants to be. One is fully indoctrinated into the ideology and the other is so afraid of it to be viewed negative by it, that they're handicapped. Right. Um, that's what you see with Andy Stanley, right? And then it's then it's wrapped in this fake mold of trying to love like Jesus, right? Um, mm. Which we know is a facade, right? Read your Bible, and you would know that that that's not what Jesus is about, right? Um, and so, to me, that's that's kind of where where it why both are kind of handcuffed in terms of what I would say to these men. I was man. That I can say on this podcast, uh, just hey, we all go ahead, go ahead, let it I out. Mean, at, the, at the end of the man, uh, at the end of the day, you have to be a man of principle, right? Yes. We cannot capitulate to fear of culture or fear of man, right? Be a man of principle and stand on two feet and be the leader that a woman would need you to be, be the leader that children need you to be and stand on principle and do your job. Right. That's what I would, mm -hmm. that's what I would tell. Them, so. Yeah. And, and I would, I would echo that sentiment and, um, and say, you know, again, across the board that pastors need to open their Bibles mm -hmm. and preach the word in yep. season and out of season. Yep. Right. And not, and not as, as a, to proof text, their silly ideas that they get from the Academy, but to say, no, like, we're created beings and the designer is the definer. So God defines sex as male and female. Who are we to listen to anyone who says, well, actually it's a, it's a spectrum. If God defines marriage as between a man and a woman for one lifetime, who are we to say anything different? So I think pastors have a tremendous responsibility mm -hmm. um, to preach the gospel and the whole counsel of God um, to, to a lost and dying world. And, and sometimes people say, oh, you don't preach the choir. But no, you actually do preach the choir because you don't know who's saved in there. Mm -hmm. So so it has to start in, in the church and sort of work its way out into the culture. But to your point, Monique, the, the culture has done a far better job of discipling the church in terms of its definitions, its presuppositions, its its arguments, its tactics, its strategies than the church has done discipling the, the culture. And the other part I'll say is this. A big part of this has to start in the home. Yes. And and where this comes back, particularly to the black community, is that many of our homes have been the black family has been in a state of distress for sixty plus years. Mm -hmm. Now, when Moynihan wrote his report in nineteen sixty five, what was considered a national emergency was a twenty five percent out of wedlock birth rate. We've been steady at seventy percent since the mid nineties. Yeah. I I would give my left arm to get back to twenty five percent. And just go around talking, you know, with my, with my right arm swinging. Like, I, I, I would do that for the sake of my ethnic kinsmen. 
Um, but until our family situation comes back together, we're in for a rough road because all of these things, discipleship starts in the home with a, with a husband and a wife who, but I'm talking particularly the believers who understand the beauty of God's created order. Men have responsibilities and women have responsibilities. Yes. Now in our culture, um, it's a lot easier to talk about men's responsibilities, even in the church. So it's like men, every man has to provide and protect for his home. Okay. And then you say, okay, what does every woman have to do? Well, you know, we don't want to put any boundaries and tell women what they, mm -hmm. so it, it becomes mm -hmm. a lot more difficult. And sometimes a lot of guys are fighting that in their home. And yeah. for a lot of men, not just black, a yes. lot of men are the fourth most, most respected man in their woman's life mm -hmm. after her father, her pastor, and her boss. And wow. I think guys are starting to wake up to that and say, look, everybody else gets respect for you. Yeah. You mm -hmm. understand order in every, and I know people don't like the word submit. But yeah. it's in the Bible, so we shouldn't run from it. But mm -hmm. you you yield to the authority of another in every other aspect of your life until you come home. And then you want to fight. Mm -hmm. Fight, 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 fight. Mm -hmm. And then when things fall apart, you say, oh, well, you know, it's because, uh, you know, marriage is not for me, hot girl, some all that other nonsense. But we got to mm -hmm. get back to the basics because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we the job now is really a reclamation project. Like, yeah. Things have been destroyed. It is going to take multiple generations for us to turn this around. The church is it has to play um, a significant role in getting our minds right in terms of definitions, in terms of order, in terms of structure. But particularly within the black community, you you have the black leadership class that has to get its act together. Mm -hmm. There are other institutions that that need to be all hands on deck. HBCUs. To me, every historical black college and university should have as part of its written mission to improve relationships between black men and black women. Wow. At the at the very least. Now you can go from that. You can say we're offering class on black love. We're, we're doing wife school on the weekends for young women who want to get their, their MRS degree along with their mm -hmm. BS or their masters, right? We're doing husband boot camp for men who want the same. Um, K through 12 education. Take the pride flags and BLM stuff down. Talk about the success sequence mm -hmm. and let young people know that if you finish high school, get a job, get married, by the time you hit your mid thirties, your chances of being in poverty is in the single digits. Like these are things that we have to start putting into our culture. We, we, we have to be honest about the effect that imagery is where we started imagery, mm -hmm. music to me. Any, any man under the age of 40 years old, really 50, but let's say 40, has been thoroughly acculturated, particularly black men, to see the young women in his community as either female dogs or garden tools. Mm -hmm. That is the primary way that hip hop refers to black women. Mm -hmm. So to think that that guy is going to turn around and see a woman in his neighborhood and say, I want to marry her before we you know, have a child together. No. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. not, 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 not in the inner city. So we have to, to even address how we do media. And that means taking bread out of the mouths of, of artists that we like. But it shouldn't be that hard. Yeah. Because there's certain messages. Let me tell you something. Eminem has been on the hip hop scene for a long time. This guy's talked about doing harm to his mama, his, his baby mama. Mm -hmm. He has never let the letters N I G slip out of his mouth. Not mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. He's talked about all types of crazy stuff, but he understands that if he ever says the wrong word, two letter, two syllable N word, mm -hmm. his career is over. Mm -hmm. The same standard we have for Eminem. We should have for every other hip hop artist. Yes. Every other hip hop artist. So we got to get culture. We have to get um, uh, our, our policy, right? To the extent that policy can, can move the needle small, but it can, mm -hmm. we have to get our homes and, 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 and we have to get the, the education, which is where discipleship often happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Part scholarship, part discipleship, academic mastery, moral formation, and we got to get the church. So if we want to save the home, we got to address the church house, the schoolhouse, 
the state house, and the movie house for culture. Um, and that's how you start to, to turn a needle. But that, this is a multi-generational project. Um, and it's not going to happen in one election cycle. And it's not going to happen until Black folk writ large are willing to commit 90% of our social capital, cultural influence, and political sway to this particular project, which means pulling a significant amount of our resources away from the Ibram Kendi mm -hmm. uh, task of, of redeeming and restoring white people. Because really, and, I, and, I, and I'll land a plane here, people like Kendi, the aristocracy, I call them the black leadership class, but in fact, they're really the white leadership class Ooh. because think, think sports. A good coach coaches his team. He says, you missed this pick in basketball or you missed this block in football. Now, he, he may talk about the other team because because these are opponents on the on, on, on the field, right? Not enemies, opponents, not enemies. Kendi, to the extent that he's a cultural physician, his clinic says whites only because the only people that he speaks to and expects anything from are white folk, particularly white liberals. Mm -hmm. The people who he sit now, they have books to buy. They have mm -hmm. places they need to live. They have um, seminars that they need to purchase. Uh, um, you know, they have conferences they need to attend. Mm -hmm. All of these things, this is what white people have to do to show their allyship and show that mm -hmm. they're anti-racist. Now I show up and say, okay, what do black folk need to do in order to help improve our social condition? Well, you just need to vote and march. And that's yep. it. Yep. So th that means if we want to turn this around, we need to have a moratorium on the, on the equity industrial complex for at least 10 years in wow. order to get ourselves aligned to the hard project of doing the work to improve our own social condition. Obviously with God's providence and help, mm -hmm. but we're going to have to put our hands to our own till and, and to work our own land if we want to be able to um, plant a good seed and a good crop and, and yield a harvest that's, you know, 50, 60, 100 fold. Man, that's so good. That is yeah. so good. That it, some of what you said reminds me of um, Jason Riley's book, Please Stop Helping Us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and who, who are we talking to and who is doing the work and who needs to do the work on our behalf and why? Um, mm -hmm. And when you get the wrong people doing the work, you know, it, it, beca it can become detrimental. It can become um, yes. like damaging, you know, within the community. And it also infantilizes the community. Absolutely. You know, and mm -hmm. Kevin has said this before. Um, and Kevin, you probably said, you know, in your own words, better than I do. But, you know, if if I'm constantly waiting for the white person to come and rescue me or to give me permission to use my voice, I'm also waiting for the white person to fix my problems. Always. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that takes mm -hmm. any autonomy away from me. Yeah, it does. It does. And Delano, you talk about, you know, the five P's and when you were just talking, it reminded me of something. Um, when it comes to Marx, right? Marx is all about mm -hmm. the means of production and the the cultural Marxists, the cultural, um, uh, they, they, they realized that the means of production wasn't just economics, it was cultural, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they attacked those areas because you have to disrupt the means of cultural production. And so mm -hmm. that is education, that is religion, mm -hmm. that is, uh, uh, entertainment, art, all these things, because what do you use to pass down your culture? You use these, these institutions. So it sounds like the black institutions, the black means of cultural production to reproduce what mm. we once had yes. has been co-opted by others to disrupt us, to stop us from passing those things down. And that is why our grandparent generation is so different than our generation yes. or Gen Z. Yes. Because we've been co-opted. And so what I hear you saying is we have to take these elements back, right? Mm. We have to start to take control of our own cultural means of production, right? And and not 
this outside entity or outside forces that seem to be who we're capitulating to for yeah. their goodwill. Right. Um, and so I think that's, uh, that's harder said than done. How do we take it back from them? How do we take our education back from the, the, you know, the professors, how do we take our churches back from these preachers that are totally bent on, subjecting themselves to the democratic party leadership like how do we take it back to to where yeah. we can get back on solid footing I'm, i mean part of it is you know we have to use discernment there's some institutions that i think are beyond repair at this mm -hmm. moment so certain people you don't have to exit yeah. and rebuild something else mm -hmm. and i think other institutions that can be influenced you know for the good and when i say good i'm, I'm talking biblically aligned yes. one of the things that i yes. appreciate about this podcast and you, Monique, is that you address these issues from a biblical perspective using equal weights and measures. So there's nothing. So I'm pretty certain there's nothing that you would say to a black Christian that you wouldn't say to a white Christian on a, right. on a you know, with regard to a similar, you know, um, type of issue. So yeah. because, and I'll, and again, uh, let me give you credit where credit is due. You, I, I, you were the first person who I've ever seen use the phrase speak truth to error as opposed to speak truth to power, mm -hmm. right? We, we need that. That's part of how we do this in some of these institutions. Um, but I think the, the first part of it is to bring attention to it and to raise awareness and, and platforms like this help do that because so much of what we do in life is auto-programmed. You know, my wife and I, we homeschool and we've been talking, you know, to a couple from our church. And, and one of the things that I said is like, look, all of us, particularly if, if you have not, um, you know, if, if you went to public school, like I did all but two years of my, you know, formal K through 12 education, you just assume that it's the norm that when your kids get five years old, you just turn them over to somebody. Right. Um, but that's not the norm, but it, well, it doesn't have to be the norm. So a big part of what, what I think what we need to do is just to say, look, what we've been doing, we don't have to do. And what we see today has not always been because mm. black people of a, of a different generation believe in, in the do for self ethos. They believed in agency. Mm -hmm. They believed in responsibility to the extent that they, you know, work with white folks. It was always, we are doing this for ourselves and we invite, you know, your help to the extent that it that it's aiding in our project. But the moment we started seeing that quote unquote pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is a is a bad thing. Well that's only a bad thing if you presuppose that you're quadriplegic and that you can't walk. Mm -hmm. But if somebody grew up in New York and there are many times in high school I had to make the decision now do I want to walk this 20 minutes or do I want to wait for the bus? Now the bus said it's going it's going to come. It promised me it was going to come at 5 30. But it's 545 and I can either choose to, to wait for the 630 bus or I can get up, take the, the legs that God has given me, the strength that he's granted me for this day and walk my butt home. And that's what I always chose to do. Um, and, and I think this is part of what we need to do is to say, look, we have the resources, right? We have yeah. the strength we have the capacity. We can do this. And this is natural. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has children understand that at a certain point in your child's development, somewhere between two and four years old, the task that you used to do for them, they will, they will develop a phrase that's new for you, but will become increasingly common for them. Mm -hmm. No, I can do it. Yep. No, I can do it. I, I can do it by myself. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we have to get back to that because, because we've lost that. But in many respects, and this goes back to the conversation we're having about gender, um, at a certain point, we hit a fork in the road as a, as a community. And particularly as a relationship between black men and black women, um, Uncle Sam transitioned from uncle to, to daddy. And he said, look, I'm going to offer you a good deal, right? You've been held back for so long. I'm going to offer you material resources, money, food shelter, things that you would have relied on for your husband for, um, you know, you know, uh, in times past, but I'm going to offer it to you. But in order to ha get that, you need to leave him. Mm -hmm. And, and we've made that trade and yep. the, 
the, the marriage between black feminists and white liberals on the left is is one of the most successful interracial relationships that we've ever, ever seen in this country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and it won't be until we're able to sort of disrupt that, then we can start to see progress on, on some of these issues. I'll take that statement a, sta- uh, a step further and say that <laughs> when, when black people, when black preachers started allowing the government into our churches, we decided mm. at that point that we were going to leave our God and go sleep with, with the politician. Mm. Like that, that is where a lot of this has landed us. Um, mm. Y'all going to get yeah. us counsel. We, Ooh, we I- uninvited from the cookout. <laughs> we can't go in. Mean, yeah, but, it, but it's so <laughs> don't play no games. But it's real, like this, this real, con- yeah. this real talk. And yeah. so yeah. Yeah, there's there are so many other things that man, I wish we could go down the whole the whole marriage of black and LGBTQ plus, and you know why in the seventies Herbert Marcuse was talking about you know bringing black people in, in 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 under this you know banner of communism with those who have been ostracized mm. and cast aside because they were lgbtq plus they need a new proletariat mm. and only only those born with skin color you know can say well i was born this way but what do you hear from those along mm-hmm. the lgbtq plus spectrum i was born this way so then mm-hmm. it ties us together yeah. there's so much but it it comes down to how are we going to use our voice and how are our men going to use their voice to call back you know normalcy to call us back to an ideology um or a worldview that is god-centered and so yeah. that is that's our call and our charge to all of you who may be watching, regardless of skin color, calling our country back, calling those in your sphere of influence back to a biblical ethos. So it, it starts in your home. Your first ministry is in your home. And so Amen. how are you raising your kids? How are you raising your, you know, not raising your wives, but, um, you know, as men, how are you leading your wives in that? Shepherding and discipling. Should that uh, yeah. but see, here? So here's the thing. I, I I had this thought this morning. Um, as I was I think I was reading the word this morning. I had this thought that I was recently at a conference, and I had I re- I have had men, and it's usually only men, come up to me and say, "Hey, I'm not sure how to have this conversation with my wife because she's bought into all of the things that you're saying." Mm. So I generally talk about CRT. I talk about feminist theory. I talk about queer. Th- like I, this, these are, that's the vein that I I speak in, and so I just started thinking this morning about the feminization of the the male voice and how many husbands I have that come over and say, "My wife is steeped yeah. in this." Yeah, and it, it's it's sad because it makes me wonder. And this isn't you know to blame men, but. It makes me wonder. Well, I wonder what happened. No, no, blame mm-hmm. us. No. We need to take responsibility. Yes. But, I mean, we, I, we need it. I don't want to be like I. I would never want to be in a marriage with a guy who was like, "You can't read that book." But at some point, still- my husband might not might need to be like, "Boo, you can't read that book." Like this ain't for you. Right. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But if I now, if I'm reading it for education purposes, I read a whole bunch of stuff right. that I would never right. suggest to somebody to read. But you know, it's like. How do we, how do y'all protect the entity with, that is the mm. family, protect mm. the church, protect the children, protect the structure? Because as the church goes, though, there goes the culture. Yeah, true. You know what I mean? And yeah. so, I, mean. I don't know, it's just a thought, but there's so much we could talk about. We are definitely over time here on Off Code. And so mm. I just want to thank you, Delano, for being here yeah. and for sharing your wisdom. Kevin, as always, phenomenal. Thank you very much for being thank in this all. with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to all of you, thank you so much for staying engaged and for watching for, I know doing your part to lead your family. I know you in the thick of it. I know, I know you're doing what you need to do. So we are praying for you as well. This is going to be our last off code before 2024. We're going to take December off and I'm traveling throughout November. So we won't have time to record another episode. So may God bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. Um, and may mm. you enjoy your your holiday season. Merry Christmas. Happy Thanksgiving. And to you guys and to your families as well. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Appreciate you. Thanks. Have a good rest of your year, everybody. Bye.